installation is the reverse removal. Start by inserting the tie rod that's extended on the right through here. Insert it up and over the automatic transmission selector cable and through that portion of the cross member. Push it to the right far enough for the left tie rod to clear this point here. I'm actually going to have to remove this uh, plastic cap on the end of the inner tie rod here because it's going to get in the way. Insert the inner tie rod into this area here. Then slide the rack slightly to the left. Then you can push it up and feed the input shaft where it needs to be. Then just turn the rack slightly clockwise and Push it up. Install the bushing and clamp on the passenger side first. If you install the bracket on the driver's side first, there won't be enough room to place the upper clamp on top of the rack. Now we're going to install the right mount for the power steering rack. It's just a bushing that wraps around it, and then there's a clamp at the top and bottom. The thicker clamp to the left goes on top of the rack, and the thinner clamp to the right with the ridges on the side goes on the bottom. You'll see they both have an arrow on them, and at the top over there you'll see FR, that's for front, so you got to make sure those arrows are pointing towards the front of the vehicle. First just wrap the bushing around the steering rack. Then slide the upper clamp on. I like to leave the seam facing towards one of the seams. Right here it's facing towards the front. That's to prevent the bushing from binding up when the clamp is tightened down. Make sure that the bracket arrow is pointing towards the front of the vehicle. Leave the clamp bolts slightly loose so you have some wiggle room to install the bracket on the driver's side. Then you can install the fasteners on this side. The bracket installs in this direction with the exhaust hanger hook pointing towards the back of the vehicle. Install the long fasteners first. They go through the rack and into the subframe. You may have to slide the rack slightly to get the holes to the line. just to get the clamp high enough so you can install the smaller ones on each side. Now you could fully tighten the fasteners on both sides.
then tighten up the two long bolts here, and then the outer ones. Then reconnect your return line and your pressure line. After the lines are threaded in by hand, snug them up with a flare wrench. Don't forget to reinstall this clamp up here. You'll see it's got a alignment pin. So when you have it in the right place, it'll sit flush with the subframe here. Once it sits flush, just install the 10 millimeter bolt and tighten it up. Or just move it back and forth until you feel that lineman peg fall in place. Sorry, I couldn't do that one-handed. I just pushed it up slightly and that pin popped right in to the subframe. Already installed the bolt, just snug it up. To be perfectly honest, I'd recommend putting this clamp on and putting the bolt in loosely before tightening the steering rack down. That way you have a bit of wiggle room to make this easier. After you have the bolt on this clamp loosely, tighten the steering rack down, then finish tightening this down. The next step is to center the rack, but before you do that, make sure that the inner tie rods are pointing out and that they're not pointing down. Otherwise the bellows can get bound up on this piece here or this piece here. Now we're gonna pop the U-joint back on the input shaft. Turn the wheel to get the splines to align. To make it easier to install and adjust the outer tie rods, we want to extend the driver's side tie rod and coarsely center the rack. The easiest way to do this is to use the clock spring center indicator. If you want to check if your clock spring centered, turn your wheel to the left. And in that corner there, you'll see a yellow dot lined up if your clock spring centered. Since you locked the wheel all the way to the left earlier, turning the wheel to the right until the mark lines up will get the rack close enough to center. Here's what it looks like if the clock spring's not centered. So I'm going to turn the wheel another rotation, then we're going to look at that mark again. And you'll see that yellow dot has shifted. If the clock spring isn't at the center of its travel, you can damage it by turning the wheel too far. This can cause the horn, airbag, or cruise control to fail. Inside, I'm just turning the wheel to the right, one rotation at a time, until the indicator lines up. Once it lines up, complete that rotation of the wheel so it's in the 12 o'clock position. Let's put the exhaust back together. These only go in one way. There's a larger hole on one side, a smaller hole on the other. The larger hole is the side that the spring bolt goes into. Just put the fastener on a bit. Don't put it on all the way, otherwise it'll be difficult to get the other spring bolt on. For the other nut, just reach up and over. You won't be able to get it from underneath. Just gonna thread it on a bit by hand. I'm not gonna thread it on all the way. 
case I need some movement in order to connect it up with the rest of the exhaust system. That way I could just move it if I need to later. Don't forget to reconnect your O2 sensor or you'll set a code later. Take this end of the connector and hook it onto this bracket here first. Then just connect the connectors. Now I'm going to raise the rear of the exhaust, push it back slightly, line it with the mid pipe. That's why I left it loose so I have a bit of movement here. Now that I got the pipe up, I'm just going to put this insulator back on and take the weight off of my arms. Makes it a lot easier. It's a lot easier to put the nut back on. Just compress the bolt with your fingers to compress the spring and then put the nut on. All the other spring bolts on the other side. The flange with the wider hole is where the spring bolt goes. The smaller hole is where the nut goes. Now we can tighten up all four spring bolts. On this side, rather than swinging your ratchet, put a box and wrench on the other end and use that as your ratchet. Then I'm going to finish tightening up this side. The studs have actually gotten too long. I'm going to need a deep well socket to finish this off. Just snug it up. Finish tightening up this side. Same deal with these two. Like, like to tighten one part way and then the other. and wrench on there to finish tightening. That's it. You're just tightening the nut until this bolt bottoms out. 
on the flange here. Any further and you're just damaging the threads. I've already popped this insulator back on. Don't forget to reinstall the other two back there. The front of the exhaust bolted in, this is pretty easy. That's done. Install the other exhaust hanger on the right front of the cat. All our exhaust hangers are replaced. Driver's side, front of the cat. Passenger side, front of the cat. And the two hangers in the back. Now reinstall the outer tie rods. The boots on the old ones were starting to leak grease, so I decided to replace them. On the driver's side, I counted four valleys, so I'm just gonna count that. One, two, three, Four, hold the screwdriver there and just put the jam nut down flush to it. Now I'm just going to thread the tie rod on up to the jam nut. Now remember what I said before, there is a left and a right tie rod. On the OE tie rods, it's stamped right on there. L for left, that's the driver's side. R for right, that's the passenger side. I'm just going to thread it on until it hits the jam nut. Don't cross thread it. Make sure you get it on straight. You want the stud on the end of the tie rod pointing up. This is the passenger side tie rod. We still have this protective cap we didn't remove earlier. Just grab it and pull it off. Same deal here on the passenger side. I counted seven valleys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm just going to spin the jam nut onto my screwdriver. You can see an R is printed on this one. It goes on the passenger side. Don't cross thread it. And you want the stud on the end of the tie rod pointing up. I altered the position of the jam nut slightly in order to get the stud on the tie rod pointing up, but don't worry about it. We'll do the fine adjustment after it's bolted to the knuckle. When you're at the alignment shop, what they're going to do is they're going to break this jam nut loose and rotate the inner tie rod in order to adjust this. There's no need to remove the tie rod from the knuckle to do an adjustment. Now just reinstall the tie rod into the knuckle. 
Remember, you want to bring it down from underneath. Reinstall the castle nut. It's a 17. And get it good and snug. Now you want to turn it until the hole lines up. So just turn it little by little. the hole lines up like that. Install a new cotter pin. It shouldn't be so large that you have to pound it in with a hammer, but it shouldn't be so loose that it jiggles around excessively. Here's the cotter pin assortment I use. I got it at a local auto parts store for just over $10. Highly recommend that you replace cotter pins. Don't reuse them. The reason being, cotter pins are there to prevent critical fasteners from coming loose, and they're so inexpensive that it just seems silly to even think about reusing them. After putting it through, I just bend it up, take one half, bend it up, and back, like this, and then just bend the other side down. Then I just finish staking it down with a hammer. And on the other side. And that's how it looks when it's done. Same thing on the driver's side. Install the castle nut. Get it good and snug. Bend it back, up and over. Tap the end down. Bend the other end back, down over the nut, and tap that down. And that one's done. Now we can fine adjust the tie rods and snug up the jam nuts. Two, three, four, five, six. All right, I'm at six threads right now. I gotta be at seven. So I'm gonna loosen the jam nut up. To adjust the tie rod out with the threaded rod pointing at you, turn it clockwise. To adjust it in, turn it counterclockwise. After adjusting, spin the jam nut by hand until it bottoms out on the outer tie rod before counting the threads. This tie rod is one thread short, so I need to turn it clockwise. Now if as you're turning the inner tie rod, the boot starts getting twisted, just squeeze the spring clip on the other side and just turn the boot to relieve that tension. You don't want to get it too twisted up, otherwise you could damage it. Here's a look at that squeeze clip. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm right where I need to be. I'm just going to snug up the 19 millimeter jam nut. You don't need to make it too tight because it's just going to get broken loose when the alignment is done anyway. I'm going to 
going to check the positioning one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Same deal on the driver's side. One, two, three. It's at three. I need to adjust it out a bit more, so I'm going to turn the, going to loosen the jam nut, turn the inner tie rod. Count the threads. One, two, three. A little bit more. One, two, three, four. All right, now I'm just going to snug up the jam nut. Wouldn't be a bad idea to put a backup wrench on the tie rod end here, but I don't have another 19 millimeter line around right now. Now if you snug up the nut, recount. Then put the wheels back on. I'm just installing the lugs loosely with an impact temporarily. I'll use a torque wrench later. Now we have to center the rack. You can see, while the steering wheel in there is nice and straight, the tires are far from it. This is the driver's side, and this is the passenger side. So what I'm going to do is put the keys in the ignition to unlock the steering wheel, and I'm just going to turn it until the wheels are pointing straight ahead. I'm just going to eyeball it for now. This is a very coarse adjustment. And right about there is good enough. And to check to make sure the wheels are pointing straight, you can look down from the top, and more importantly, look down from the front and to the back. You can also check the passenger side wheel. Now here's exactly what I was referring to. You can see while the wheels are pointing straight, look how far the steering wheel's out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pop off that U-joint again, so we disconnect the steering wheel from the input shaft, then we're gonna turn the wheel straight, and then pop it back down so that the wheel is centered with respect to the steering rack. Now earlier, the reason why I didn't reinstall the fastener here is for this reason. You won't be able to pull this U-joint off with that fastener installed, and it may not be pointing in the right direction for you to be able to remove it. So I'm just gonna pull up on the U-joint to disconnect it from the steering rack. You may have to wiggle back and forth while pulling up. After turning the wheel back to the 12 o'clock position, double check to make sure the clock spring is centered. So I'm gonna turn it to the left, so the flat parts in this lower corner here. I'm gonna check. And as you can see, the yellow mark is still there. It's also not a bad idea to remove the key, so at least the wheel won't turn too far out of position while you're installing the U-joint. Now we're just gonna pop the U-joint back onto the input shaft.
turn the steering wheel the minimal amount to get the splines to line up, then push it down. There's no need to reinstall that lower fastener and tighten up the upper fastener until you're satisfied that the rack is centered. And that's pretty good. And the wheels are pointing pretty close to straight ahead. The true test will come when I'm driving down the road and I see where I have to keep the steering wheel in order to continue going straight. And that's when we'll make our fine adjustments. I first have to get that lower bolt in there. As you can see, it's facing the wrong way. So now that the U-joint's on, I can turn the wheel to get access to where I have to put it in. Which is right there. You always want to tighten that fastener first. Because if you tighten this fastener first and the U-joint isn't centered just right, this bolt won't go through that rounded portion on the input shaft and you won't be able to install it. Then you can snug up the upper fastener. Just turn the wheel if you need to get access to it. Now we're going to refill the system with power steering fluid and bleed it. Highly recommend Honda brand power steering fluid. If you can't get Honda fluid, at least get power steering fluid designed for Honda power steering systems. Fill it up to the upper level line. Don't worry if you overfill it slightly. I've actually overfilled it a bit because the new rack and the hoses, which have practically completely drained of power steering fluid, will need to be filled, and this level is going to drop pretty rapidly. Now that the reservoir is filled, we're going to start the vehicle up and turn the wheel from lock to lock a few times. I'm going to return the steering wheel to the center position, shut the engine down, and check the level in the reservoir. Now, as you can see, the fluid's got bubbles in it, and that's the air being purged out of the system. You could also see how low the fluid is now. I filled it slightly above the upper level, about a quarter of an inch above the upper level, and we're way below the lower level now. Now I'm going to be real careful not to fill it beyond the upper level line, because most of the system has now been filled with fluid. And you can see we're pretty close to the full line. Ideally, you just want to be between these two lines. You don't want to be higher than the upper level. You don't want to be lower than the lower level. So this is the max line. This is the min line. So I'm just going to go back into the vehicle, do the same thing I did before, turn the steering wheel from lock to lock, and I'll leave you here.
and as you can see the level dropped again to right at the lower level. So now we're just going to fill it to the upper level line again. So all in all, that took almost two bottles of power steering fluid. So we're going to start the vehicle up again. I don't expect it to drop by an appreciable amount anymore. And as you can see, it hasn't dropped by that much. It may be dropped by an eighth of an inch. So it's safe to drive and check the centering of the rack now. After the vehicle is down on level ground, I'll fill it up to the upper level one last time. Now before we get out on the road and test this thing, it's a good idea to check for any leaks. This is the driver's side tie rod, and to the left you can see the lines. That's the return line. You can see it's not showing any signs of leaking. Look a little bit further back and up, and you can see the pressure line. That's also not showing any signs of leaking. Also, since this is a new rack, check the hard lines. You can see two of them over here. And check where they terminate, which is one here. and one up here. You can also check here by the master cylinder. On the left is the pressure line, and on the right is the return line. Now I'm gonna load the vehicle until the tire just touches the ground. Then I'm going to torque the lugs to 80 foot-pounds in a crisscross pattern, from side to side. And just check them. And repeat the process on the other side. These particular hubcaps have a mark on them. This part of the hubcap should be pointing towards the valve stem. Snugged up, you can lower the vehicle the rest of the way. Now that the vehicle's on level ground, I could top off the power steering fluid reservoir. While it's fine where it is between the min and the max line, I like to fill it up to the max line simply because if there's ever a leak, you know it was filled up to the max line. So you're not questioning whether or not you just don't remember how much you filled it. test drive. And I'm going down a straight road right now and that's actually pretty good. I'd say I'm between the 12 o'clock and the 1 o'clock position and that's just fine and alignment will clear that right up. So I'm not even going to touch it. Let's finish this up. Now, if when you're driving down the road in a straight line, your wheel's like this, your rack's way out, you should adjust it. If it's like this, again, it's way out, you should adjust it. What you want to aim for is halfway between the 12 and 11 o'clock or 12 and 1 o'clock position when going down a straight road. 
If the wheel isn't centered well enough, remember the approximate position the wheel was in when going straight. Remove the lower bolt and loosen the upper bolt on the U-joint, then turn the wheel to that position. Pull the U-joint off and turn the wheel to the 12 o'clock position. Make sure the clock spring indicator is lined up, then reinstall the U-joint. Road test the vehicle again. Repeat the process until you're satisfied. Then just pop the plastic cover back on. You'll see here that it's got a slit that you have to open up to fit it around the column. I'm gonna get it under the carpet here. And I'm gonna open up the back portion to get it under the lower portion of the column. Now I'm gonna align it with the studs. And I'm gonna open up the upper portion. And there it is. Reinstall the three clips. You just push them in. You may have to wiggle the cover in order to get them to fit. There's one over here. And one hidden under the carpet down here. Then reinstall the two clips. The larger one goes down here. And the smaller one goes up here. Be sure to get in alignment as soon as possible. The position of the outer tie rods on the threaded inner tie rods determines the toe angle. This is a critical alignment setting that if out of specification will cause handling issues and accelerated tire wear. The toe is adjustable on the rear wheels too, so get them checked while you're at it. 